independent Louisiana poets. First, a, a little introduction, a word about the title. The label independent avoids confronting what a conservative or liberal, uh, uh, a right-wing or left-wing poetics might be. By poetics, I mean the theory and practice of the art of poetry. The poets we'll examine deserve the label independent. They dance to their own tune and don't take any wooden nickels. They don't belong to what Harold Rosenberg called years ago the herd of independent minds. I have a mental subtitle also, uh, Solitary slash Solidarity. Solitary expresses the alienation that many Southerners feel in a cultural climate hostile to them, their past, their beliefs. Solidarity is their determination to identify with that past and with others of like mind. I see that word frequently used by progressives in reference to their cohorts and mobs. Well, we also can have it. In 19th century France, alienation became the normal condition of the literary artist, though not necessarily painters and musicians. The condition, or disease, has since spread to other Occidental countries and other arts, becoming not just passive separation from established customs, but deliberate aggression, even anarchy. So much that, as someone put it, if art doesn't have the potential for disaster, it isn't art. Bourgeois artist is generally an oxymoron, a contradiction. This is or was partly a pose. Big name but alienated painters thumbing their nose sell their stuff to the Whitney Museum or private collectors for half a million per objet. We in the South, in contrast, experience genuine alienation imposed from our traditions and beliefs as we are manipulated by bullies, foreigners, and rabble. That is the everyday experience of Southerners, unless, of course, they go over to the enemy, which I'll call New York interests. <laughs> I am not a true Southerner. I was born in Colorado, but I have credentials for Dixie nonetheless. My home address has been in a Confederate state, and the pun is intended, the place and the condition of mind, uh, uh, for all but 15 of my years, and my years are not few in number, as you can see. One of my great-grandfathers was a Virginian. Moreover, Southerners and Americans from the Rocky Mountain and Desert West have much in common, including a shared disdain of the political, financial, and so-called intellectual establishments based in D.C. and New York. Finally this, when I go up north on the East Coast, my accent becomes quite markedly Southern. I exaggerate my New Orleans speech. And finally, Professor Clyde Wilson has certified me. In 1932, Robert Penn Warren wrote that in the South, the old values having been made explicit because they no longer went without saying, had undergone testing by the new. That was 85 years ago. We know that they are now under attack. Southerners must continue to resist. We must build Southern character the way you form children's character, by teaching them to discriminate the good, the true, and the beautiful, and the safe from the false, ugly, pernicious, dangerous, and poisonous. Good poetry can contribute to such education. It has been associated for centuries, indeed perhaps to millennia, with the formation of taste and judgment. Broadly speaking, contemporary poets in Louisiana remain rooted, loyal to tradition, including ethnic 
tradition. They have a strong concern for place, often in a down-home sense. Many have deep religious belief. They are proud of their identity and see themselves as part of a functioning community. They feel togetherness, or what William Wright, a, for, a southerner, called a close-knit literary kin who share a profoundly beautiful and unique area of the United States. They may show a sense of order, that rage for order, which Wallace Stevens identified in the idea of order at Key West. And as writers, they agree with William Carlos Williams. The classic is the local, fully realized, words marked by a place. Nevertheless, most of these writers tend toward liberalism because of the conviction that they've been oppressed, or more likely, more dangerous, because they have been told that they, like their ancestors, are oppressors or because they've spent their careers at universities. <laughs> their liberal views are generally tropistic, knee-jerk. Few really think very well. Four such poets declined to have their work appear in the paleoconservative magazine of which I am the poetry editor. One sanctimonious but forgetful chap discovering tardily its editorial tendencies, wrote to withdraw his poem, but too late. It had already appeared, and he'd even cashed his check for $50. <laughs> Some of those most deeply rooted in tradition, including religious tradition, especially Cajuns, are liberals, outspoken and activist. I think of the Cajun poet Daryl Bourke. He does not recognize that multiculturalist and globalist forces, while paying obeisance to marginalized cultures, such as his, will destroy them quickly. Consider this. In a geodesic dome in Hawaii, serving as a test and experiment station in connection with future exploration to Mars, Gumbo, along with such treats as pho, sushi, and falafel, was served to the crew. When voting patterns in Louisiana, a red state already, are studied more closely by the social engineers, and someone trumpets around how many Confederate flags are displayed in the Louisiana countryside, gumbo may disappear. Progressive thinking in immigration, both legal and illegal, will have given the death blow. A second example of such liberalism among Louisiana poets is Martha Serpas, S-E-R-P-A-S, a certified hospital chaplain and professor of writing at the University of Houston. She was born in Lafouche Parish on Bayou Lafouche, way down in Louisiana and she had a monocultural Roman Catholic upbringing. She took a BA at LSU, then got a master's in writing at New York University, then a degree at Yale Divinity School. That's theology without God. <laughs> she has not renounced the subject matter of Louisiana, nor her concerns for the state, which I believe are genuine, especially its eroding coastline. But she is firmly in the left-wing camp, pro-LGBTQ, for instance. Exceptions do exist to this general rule that poets in Louisiana are liberal or progressive and thus against the South. I am one of the exceptions, by the way. Four of these cases we can look at today to see how they have resisted the invasion of northern idols and pieties. They are of different generations or almost. Their reasons for thinking and writing as they did and do are individual, as is their poetry, showing that there is no conservative formula even for southerners. 
They are alike in not censoring their own speech. And they integrate poetry with life around them, family, institutions, civil order. They are normal. <laughs> All four married and had children, by the way. Two generally use established metrical verse with fixed beats, stanzas, and usually rhymes. Two use free verse. That should not startle us. As George Core, the longtime editor of the Sewanee Review, wrote, one can be alive to the possibilities of contemporary literature without being wholly in its thrall. First poet, John William Corrington, known as Bill. He was born in Ohio, but of Southern parents who settled in Shreveport. Uh, his dates are 1932 to 1988. He was partly Irish. He was a combination of rebel and Tory, a romantic who needed to defend what he loved and fight against the enemies. Lewis P. Simpson considered him a mid-century illustration of the Southern loneliness artist, in exile from the historic homeland. He was a committed writer and thinker, determined to share his vision through publication, teaching, friendship, and his own brand of literary activism. Though at St. John's School in Shreveport, he was expelled for, I quote, having the wrong attitude. <laughs> the imprint of Catholicism was strong on him. He wrote from deeply held moral and religious convictions. He told a friend that he viewed serious writing as a form of the priesthood. He aspired to, I quote, work in the world for that which lies beyond the world. Poetry was a privileged means of understanding and directing life. Quoting Matthew Arnold's phrase, it may be poetry that will save us, he added that we have to return to the impulse toward poetry in order to grasp those hidden and precious aspects of ourselves damaged and torn by ideologies and especially scientism. Corrington took a BA degree from Centenary College and an MA from Rice and taught for a while at LSU. In 1966, having in hand a DPhil in English literature from Sussex, he joined the department at Loyola University. He ultimately left the teaching profession. He published four books of poetry admired by James Dickey, among others. He was called by Louis Gallo, one of the great unrecognized poets of our time. Additionally, he published four collections of short stories and novels. Mel Bradford praised one and won meaningful awards for his fiction, not the dime a dozen prizes handed out ubiquitously to writers. That is the equivalent of Nobel Peace Prizes. <laughs> Corrington remained deeply rooted in his state even when he moved to California, an unfortunate move. I'm from Caddo Parish, he would say. He dealt with those national pieties with which he did not agree by facing them squarely, denouncing them and their purveyors. I can think of no reason to be reconstructed he wrote. He named two of his sons for Confederate figures. Now, surviving as a conservative writer, finding publishers, getting favorable reviews, appears to have been easier while he was alive than presently. Probably so. But contrast Corrington with Warren, Robert Penn Warren who in 1930 contributed to the Agrarian Manifesto, I'll Take My Stand, an essay supporting the Supreme Court position, different but equal. By, sorry, by 1956, he either had changed his mind or felt obliged to act as though he had, that is to denounce his views in order to survive at Yale and as a public intellectual. He subsequently became a vocal supporter of integration and the civil rights movement. 
Ten years or so later, Corrington could have followed Warrington's lead. He did not. Among his perceived enemies was the New York literary establishment. His poetry is often closely tied to Louisiana history, characters, and speech, assuming the value of myth in a lyric mode. He wrote, Shreveport is a mythological construct of my mind. Yet it was not as a disguise for what was or what had been. The South does not need and has never needed an apologist. Certain of his poems are set elsewhere in the South, not, not just in Louisiana, such as For the Army of Northern Virginia, 1861-1961. He said, the local virtues and vices, actions and passions reveal humanity in representative ways. Now, Corrington used free verse primarily. Given his conservatism, this choice may appear contradictory. But it was in keeping with his general aim of creating a striking, innovative art. What I want to leave behind is a body of work which sneers at liberal ethics and possesses a certain barbarous quality. <laughs> Speaking of the superficial, uh, superficially civilized, whom he calls degenerates, he adds, it is the antique virtues I love and wish to memorialize. This aim fits well with his almost epic imagination, based in history but seeing through the facts to the spirit behind them. His poem, Reformation, bears an epigraph from James Joyce. It is an age, so this is Joyce, it is an age of exhausted whoredom groping for its God. He spoke of wanting a voiceless style, and he generally eschewed autobiographical writing of the confessional school type. Instead, he dramatized other figures. How about this? The poem is called Our Man in Gomorrah. <laughs> it begins, my lord, these statues, if I described the least offensive of them, this hand would wither. After evoking the booming streets full of terrible women, howling, laughing, exposing their part, the speaker says, my lord, I have served you in six provinces, and I have I lost for your sake. I have been a stranger to mercy, truth's assassin, yet I have seen nothing like this. He continues, my lord, I will be plain. What this place bodes is a doom beyond dimensions. Here there is no shame, the speaker says concluding, my lord, as terrible as all of this may seem, it is as nothing when compared with a town across the plain. Corrington also excelled in rhymed sonnets. It's not that he couldn't do good rhymed verse. The Beloved, which concerns St. John of Patmos, illustrates his skill and his characteristic embroidering on motifs, themes, and personae. Each night within its, this is a half verse, I didn't uh, uh, put in the other, a half, a half line. Each night within his cell, behind his eyes unfurled all history, the fall of empire and the earthly hell of those who turned from grace to mystery. He watched great Babylon consuming men and waited for the ending to begin. Next poet, David Middleton. He was born in 1949. He can be considered the quintessential Louisiana poet, but he's known nationally and internationally also. Some of you may have heard him speak at this conference a few years ago, and some of you know him personally. Like Corrington, he is resolutely Southern, resolutely of Louisiana, and firm in his stance. He has published four collections of verse. He was born in Shreveport, attended Louisiana Tech, 
got his PhD at LSU, not a writing PhD, a PhD on a literary figure. That is a real one. <laughs> and spent his entire teaching career at Nichols State on Bayou de Fouche. How has he avoided being radicalized? He has been firm in his rejections and creative in upholding his beliefs. His poetics are traditionalist. He uses what he calls, after Ivor Winter's uh, uh, phrase, plain style. He calls himself an old-fashioned poet. His work is far removed from the irony of early modernists who drew effects by just opposing decadent imagery from contemporary life with symbols from earlier ages of faith and romance. Um, uh, Ezra Pound, that sort. He is a devout Anglican supporting the established church, and it's, that is what he views as the established worldwide Anglican church, and its historical flowering. Thus, he believes in the word as well as words. He is not a relativist. He accepts the Thomistic view of the world as real, divinely created, good. Only by recognizing that truth, including moral truth, uh, oh, sorry, only by recognizing that truth, including moral truth, does exist within a cosmic and earthly order and by acknowledging its proper place in that order can human beings find appropriate, genuine happiness. He is committed to the classical proposition that by means of the particular, one can reach a broad level of significance, extracting, as he writes, extracting universals from the local and the known. Among major themes in his verse is place the South, his home state, both Bayou country and the North. Associated themes include family and nature. His interests are not urban, but small town, even pastoral. Mark Royden Winchell, the late Mark Royden Winchell, observing that he shunned the elliptical and ironic mannerisms of John Crow Ransom and Alan Tate, placed him closer to a third agrarian poet, Donald Davidson, whose true lyrical power and intellectual subtlety Middleton has matched, but more frequently and at an earlier age. Another commentator notes that Middleton's poems present, I quote, with remarkable steadiness, the kind of vision Davidson might have advocated, a traditional poetry that comes out of a shared communal world in which the poet faces the age's metaphysical poverties that he, like Tate, uh, might easily have indulged. This is not entirely flattering to Alan Tate here, that he might have indulged. That is, Middleton mounts a poetic attack on the whole stance behind Tate's ode to the Confederate dead, finding that the great agrarian figure imported into his account of the Confederate dead precisely those qualities of mind that the Southern tradition most hoped to avoid. Abstraction from the things themselves, narcissistic self-absorption, and the inability to trust in the common good of a shared world. Now, only someone with an appreciation of rural life uh, although Middleton was born in Shreveport, he, has gra he had grandparents in the next parish over in a little town. Uh, only someone with an appreciation of rural life could have written the 60 poems of his 2005 collection, The Habitual Peacefulness of Gruchy, Poems After Pictures by Jean-Francois Millet, the French uh, a painter who worked in Normandy. It required an understanding of history, not as Hegelian, a continuous progress via thesis and so on, but as bound by the laws of nature and human nature, as well as divine benevolence. The poems and the paintings evoked il illustrate well the connection between particulars and universals, showing at once individual peasants performing identifiable tasks in well-evoked settings, and all peasants, the essence of peasants. The sower refers to the well-known painting 
which Willa Cather, praising the painter's ability to generalize, even as he particularized, viewed as so ideal it seems inevitable. The Angelus, the final poem in the series, printed apart from the others, evokes another famous canvas. Appropriately, it has an architectural motif, the Norman church, viewed in the painting, as well as theological dimensions from Eden through the incarnation to hope in the new Jerusalem. Yet, I quote, yet here between these dreams of paradise, potatoes must be planted, tended, dug, then sacked on barrows pushed to winter bins till to feast on till the final angels come. Like Corrington, Middleton has written poems about the war. One concerns a Louisiana fight, fighting with General Lee late in the war while the furrowed Shenandoah burns farm by farm. The past is contrasted to today's South. The sprawl of car-choked highways, shopping malls, smoke drifting through the wilderness, that's wilderness with a capital W, inhabited in part by late immigrants who made the, the mid-Atlantic of our South. Technocrats, the planters of their day with cash crop mansions spread across the Blue Ridge. Yet that same old dominion lives on, the better dream of Lee and Jefferson. Elsewhere, he writes of crude recruit, recruits of Sherman and his kind, who then take slave girls between family tombs, and they disentear corpses for, 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 for their jewelry. They are one kind of monster. Their kind returns a century later as carpetbaggers, scholarwags, and yuppies, Atlanta flanked, invested, sapped within, across the metaphysic battleground on which the war continues to this hour. My third poet is Jennifer Reeser, born 1968. She lives in Westlake across the Calcasieu River from Lake Charles. She is a well-known formalist poet. On both sides, she is of mixed heritage, European-American and Native American Cherokee. The latter aspect of her background is very important to her. She has a new book in press under the title Indigenous. Her tones are not, however, generally those of today's strident multicultural warriors. She highlights historical facts and figures, dramatizing them with skill. Her verse has been favorably reviewed by critics such as R.S. Gwynn, that's Sam Gwynn, if some of you know of him, and X.J. Kennedy. He lives in the North, but he's very sympathetic to many of us down here. Kennedy called her a runner of risks and a successful one, writing verse you can understand, verse that has passion and energy, verse with a driving beat to it. Reeser has lived a stable life, combining her literary undertakings with homemaking duties. Her poems focus often on the domestic. Domestic does not mean restricted in understanding. Plants and flowers, birds and children are central to many poems. Reared as a Methodist, she joined the Assembly of God when she married. She calls herself deeply Christian, writes devotional poems, and views her faith as a significant aspect of her writing. She is not a theological questioner, however. An important vein in her poetry is patriotism, shown in the poems about the Vietnam War and about a great desecration, the World Trade Center attacks. Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and the eye passes, that is the eye of a storm, evince sensitivity to today's burdens and disasters, but she does not call for progressive solutions. Reeser employs a wide, learned vocabulary and a high rhetorical register, refusing to make her poems easy. Well, a reviewer, 
from New York, but he's all right anyhow, <laughs> wrote ab about her writing, democratic accessibility is not mandatory in poems. That does not imply that she's written a new wasteland. That is Eliot's masterpiece, which you have to have many footnotes, and then you have footnotes to the footnotes. <laughs> An important vein in her poetry is, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, beg your, uh, she, uh, uh, she, uh, 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 the same New York critic writes, writes uh, uh, apropos of her, modernism chokes on its own strangulated imagery. Real poetry actually says something intelligent. <laughs> she eschews anger and ravings. And on that topic, one cannot do better than quote James Dickey. There is a vast difference between the extremes of Rimbaud, that's Arthur, Arthur Rimbaud, the great French man from the symbolist period. One cannot do better, sorry, there is a vast difference between the extremes of Rimbaud a genius who screamed, and Allen Ginsberg, an ordinary and somewhat pretentious man who screams. <laughs> New Orleans is the topic of many of Reeser's poems, though she, she basically is, is from the Lake Charles area, such as Ursuline's After the Storm on the old Ursuline's convent, watching New Orleans drown, and French Quarter Singer. She did a book-length poem, small book, but still book, on, or epic, on the La Lallurie Horror, or what George Washington Cable called in his short story, The Haunted House on Royal Street, owned by one Delphine La Lallurie, and I'll tell you about this. There, in 1834, a huge fire destroyed nearly everything. In the midst of the conflagration, such screams were heard that bystanders concluded what neighbors had long suspected. Slaves were imprisoned inside. The prisoners, it was discovered, were kept in dreadful conditions, attached by irons of various designs, that is, in essence, tortured. Delphine escaped. The remains of the house were set upon by a mob. Of Some of the prisoners were brought out. But of course, they were up in the, they were in irons and they were up yonder. Delphine escaped. The remains of the house were set upon by a mob. Reeser's New Orleans is thus partly that of the decadent, the macabre, and the ghoulish, the sort that tourists get in quite unauthentic voodoo and ghost tours. She works in a venerable tradition much poetry and prose about that city is in this vein. Not the best, in my view, but not always the worst, given that, in her case, she does not go beyond the bounds of known facts and does not extrapolate from her stories to her old accusations, making all those whites now alive culpable. Fourth poet, Alison Pellegrin. Born 1972, Allison Pellegrin, P-E-L-E-G-R-I-N. She is a local and contemporary writer, a poet for the place and time. She is a New Orleans area native, but for years has lived in what's called the country, across Lake Pontchartrain. Pellegrin at attended Trinity School in uptown New Orleans. I know that place. I visited it for my daughter. I decided against it. Her family situation differed from that of most students there. She came from a single parent home. Her mother worked as a paralegal. A father, not at home, who was many things, including marathon runner, dance teacher, and accountant. An uncle, a former race car driver and police officer, who was in prison in Angola for, ro for robberies he organized. She has been married since 1995 and is the mother of two sons. She is a cradle Episcopalian and is still active in the church. A few contradictions here, maybe. <laughs> Beyond her family and poetry, her interests include Olympic weightlifting, 
competitions, she is working to accumulate enough points to participate in the Masters National in 2018. Her second book is called Big Muddy River of Stars, 2007. It's rich in Pellegrin's strong suits, local color, and colloquial diction. They are not ornamentation, they are a way of life. Trailers, tractors, fishing poles, nativity displays still up in March are themselves but transformed. She imagines boats named Bass Rat or Cirrhosis of the Liver. <laughs> she does not draw back from writing of the Junior League, but she doesn't put capital J and L, <laughs> nor highlighting a frozen black stable boy. That is one of these hitching posts belonging to the man she calls the slum, slum landlord. landlord. He was her landlord. But now, thanks to her, at the bottom of the river. Men get bad press occasionally, as in Junkyard Dog, who, the, where the fellow, after showing a girl what a fine machine can do, will drive her partly home and then she'll walk. But men bear burdens today, as in the past, subject in particular to industrial and marine accidents. She's got poems on people who've been injured on an offshore platform or a, a boat accident on the, on the uh, and not a, not a, uh, a, a recreation boat, a, a working barge on, on the bayou. Nor are women without fault. In Ballade of the Easy Broads, with an epigraph from François Villon, the man speaks of all you loose women from drunken nights ago, where are the easy girls I used to know? <laughs> Remembering that hellcat who let Dennis up her slip and gave him the clap. Her father is treated very gently. In one poem, it's as if he looked down from his company of stars. He's deceased look down from his company of stars. Now, she has many poems about Katrina, so you'll hear a lot about this here. In this same book, A Prayer Before Landfall evokes the night before Katrina. Somehow the kids believe we leave tomorrow for a real vacation and not a landlocked motor lodge in Cleveland, Mississippi. Katrina is not the only hurricane featured. Lost in Betsy, that's the storm of 1965, begins, Hurricane Betsy used to get the blame for what my people lost or never had. Deed to the house, photographs, kamikaze contraband smuggled into Gentilly. It, it took her, she says, 10 years to recover mentally and materially from C Katrina. Her collection Hurricane Party 20, 2012, that's right, includes the hour, uh, reflections on the hours before the storm, the exile, then the return, and the long months of rebuilding. This is across the lake in the country. She said that even after the family returned to their house rebuilt, it was not the same because so many trees were gone that the light was different. Thus, the appearance of everything was altered. She could not write about the storm or anything else for long months until she found humor in it. That occurred when, in a notebook she kept with information concerning insurance adjusters and contractors, she began drafting a list of the world's worst contractors. <laughs> Suddenly, she found herself writing a poem. Words always come back, she said. The title of Hurricane Party may be taken as a sardonic comment on the great storm, but the party applies well to much of the local color in the collection, of the, some of the Louisiana hayride variety. Pellegrin's hurricane poems differ from most that are connected to New Orleans during the storm. 
with its extensive flooding, near destruction of entire neighborhoods, and different ethnic composition. In Katrina Scribendi, she mocks much writing about the storm. Oh, look, another gawker with some poems about the hurricane. Just what we need, our drama in real life, reworked in PC. Lady, I think we all agree, no better offering to the red state south. This vein, <clears throat> pardon, this vein of Katrina writing differs from the lamentations now more than a decade old about certain neighborhoods, certain particular victims, and the repeated accusations of whites by journalists and others, including a former mayor now in federal prison on convictions of bribery and fraud. Many New Orleanians suffered in Katrina. My own experiences during the storm, I was there for 36 or 40 hours afterwards, and my subsequent exile were not my best days. Existentially speaking, Pellegrin's difficulties resembled others in some ways. She did not make of them political fodder, however. Many poems depict latter-day Cajun culture, but without the cult of ancestors and obsession with the deportation of the Acadians, which some of the Cajun poets are obsessed with the movement from Canada, Nova Scotia, down there. They're still writing about that. A Pellegrin calls her forebears simply, my people, Kunas proud. <laughs> Louisiana, a highly colored tapestry, puts together historical figures such as Jean Lafitte, roughnecks who have lost fingers, convicts, and parents, that is godfathers, with monster catfish, sloping porches, the Confederate battle flag, a tarpon rodeo, and French and Indian names, Evangeline, Rapid, of oils, Tangipahoa, the corncob people, Tangipahoa, a small Indian tribe. Where Yat repro reproduces with skill the drawl of many natives, along with other local mar markers, rue and Creole tomatoes. Bestiary of the Bayou State ranges widely through Louisiana fauna and the characters who fish, hunt, eat, listen to them, wear their skins, and occasionally are eaten by them. River of Voices suggests that Katrina survivors need, like alcoholics, a self-help organization. All oh, that's tongue-in-cheek. All is not picturesque, like several other contemporary Poets, including Reeser, uh, Pellegrin mourns the BP, BP oil spill in her Villanelle, that's a formal poem, Louisiana Crude. My, uh, my time is up. If that is, it's 10 to 10. I want to leave some time. Four. That's it. Questions? Thank you.